ladies and gentlemen, Frederick Rick Stralo coming to us as our guest today on Adam vs. the Man. As, uh, as, as he wanted to say, we could discuss his civil disobedience because the court sentenced him to 20 days in jail, two years probation for assault causing bodily injury to a family member. And now he is facing a threat of probation being revoked. Rick, welcome to Adam versus the man. I know you have been someone who has been motivated and inspired by this message and seeing other civil disobedience. I, I know that you've been engaged with this show for a long time. It's an honor to have you on as a guest. Before we jump into your immediate legal situation, is there anything that you want us to know or you want to say about your background and, and what Adam versus the man has meant for you over the years? I, I, I mean, I started following you about the time you uh, started organizing that walk to, to DC. Remember that? And it kind of fell through. And that's when you decided to do the uh, shotgun routine on the uh, Freedom Plaza. Oh, I Plaza. remember. In Freedom Plaza, there you did a little rack in the shotgun. They said that was no, that wasn't legal. So they came and got you for that. So that's when I started following you. So I followed you quite a while, helped you with your campaign a little bit. Pat, Pat yep. out a lot oh, of yeah. Oh, yeah. knows that. Handed out several of the books and stuff like that. So, yeah. I still haven't actually met you in person, but one day, you know, it'll happen. And, uh, yeah. Well, it gets less and less. Maybe, maybe when we finally meet face to face next, it'll be uh, it'll be with hazmat suits, right? Yes, sir. <laughs> anyway, yeah, uh, but yeah I, and I saw the uh, your uh, video the other day from the the first cannabis or first church of cannabis, you know, and uh, that was excellent. I, I was wondering what happened to in Texas there because I know I I watched you get arrested and all that. Got stopped twice in one day. <laughs> <laughs> within like an hour from each other so you are the master yeah no thank, thank you for thank you for mentioning that and if anybody wants to to go back and see what what rick is referencing here it's that uh i i basically beat four felonies and a misdemeanor drug charges in texas with the religious defense and uh got it negotiated down essentially to 180 dollar fine if you want to look that up adam kokesh first church of cannabis the really fun video and, and Rick, I'm, I'm glad that it was at least some inspiration for you in asserting your own rights here, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, and, you know, I, I'm going, August 3rd will be the four four years that I've been uh, dodging the, this warrant, which is no fun. I can't get a new driver's license, so that's going to, you know, stop me from, from voting pretty soon. Mm -hmm. I, not that I voted anyway, but, and, you know, I ran in 2014, I ran as a Libertarian Party candidate. And that's about the same time... Uh, I got arrested on October 1st of 2014 and the election was uh, November, right? So well, this is going back to 2014, right? Yeah. From 2014. And what happened was it, me and my little sister, my, I call her my niece because really she's my niece, but my mom and stepdad adopted her. So now she's my niece. -er. So anyway, she's about the same age as my youngest daughter, about 23, 24. And Anyway, I got into it because she, she, my mom was babysitting her daughter. And anyway, I, I asked her to do something and she just looked at me like, go to hell. And I said, all right. So the next day she came over and I saw her and I confronted her. I said, man, you got to start helping mom. She just got out of the hospital. She, you know, she, you, you got to help her. And she started screaming and hollering at me and pushing me. Next thing I know, she grabbed me by the throat and, and I just popped her one time in the nose and down she went on the ground and she, Decided to call the sheriff, so the sheriff came out. It took quite a while for the sheriff to get there because, you know, Henderson County is quite a, quite a ways around. Anyway, my mom and them beat him back, and she, my mom was telling me to get that out of there before the cops got there, and I was like, no, I'm just going to wait. So when the cop got there, they saw my little sister with the bloody nose and, and me. I didn't have no marks or anything, and I'm the, you know, the guy, so they handcuffed me, and off to jail I went. Spent the night there. It was about a $7,500 bond. But yeah, it wasn't too bad. <laughs> it wasn't too bad. But she should have went to jail too, because they lied and, and told the cops that uh, you know, I was on top of her, punching her like four or five times in the head, and that's that that wasn't even true. You know, I mean, I hit her one time, and just because she's a female, anyway, and she had a witness. No, so, no, no. I, it's, I, I don't know. If I may just, it, it it's 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 worth. I'm 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 glad that. 
our audience is getting to consider this story right now. And I, I just, what I want to point out is that when you call the police to respond to a domestic dispute, they're not going to bring justice with them. They're not going to figure out a way to resolve the situation and make the victim whole and come up with a fair assessment on whether physical isolation is appropriate, right? Whether it's appropriate, because there are cases where, yes, there are, you want, it is justified to intervene in a, in a private dispute because someone is, is, is being hurt or being threatened in a meaningful way. And you need to physically isolate one person from the other. Right. But that's the only tool the police bring other than shooting the dog, filing false arrest charges. You know, what, 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 you know, they're not, they're actually like it would, and it would be nice, right? And if more police were trained in de escalation, but even if they, if they were, they're not incentivized to, to do that, right? They get a call to respond to an incident where there's a, where, where there's some kind of, you know, you know, physical altercation involved and they have to, they're, they're, they go in with certain tools, certain incentives, certain motivations, and they have to, they want to get it done and be ready for the next call as soon as possible. They, 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 they're not motivated to de-escalate, to make, to not make an arrest. They're motivated to, to apply the tool they have is to arrest someone, to take them in, and lock them up and the system wants it that way because that's what they profit from right so when they're doing that the same crap that you're going to get in in a sort of criminal or other type of interaction with police is going to apply if someone says well he hit me and please take him away well we can't take him away because based on what you said, but we can lie in our police report just just a little bit, or we can distort things, we can exaggerate just a little bit, and then we can justify taking someone away. And the, the effect of this is, you know, don't call police unless you absolutely have to, because what are they gonna do? They're gonna make it worse for everybody. They're gonna, instead of, you know, making it fair or resolving the situation, making it safe, it's just, who's the loser? Who's the loser? Is it the dog? Do we shoot the dog? If we decide the dog's the loser, we're just going to shoot the dog when we approach and the dog approaches us. Oh, it's usually the man because that's easier to, you know, distort as opposed to the woman involved in a case like this. Not to get into the whole, you know, who's responsible sexism issue here, but this is one of the cases where the system is set up for, um, to promote male-on-male -male violence at the dis to the disadvantage of men through police because they don't care let's come up with an excuse to send you to jail. Do you feel like that's part of what happened here, Rick? Well, kind of, yeah. And the bad part is that I told my little sister to call my mom first, and she called my mom first before she called 911. So, and my mom told her to go ahead and call the, call the cop. My mom should have handed it. And my mom now, today, she looks back and she thinks that I shouldn't have called the cops, you know, from what she knows now. Yes, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I, oh, man, that is so, I want, I want, I, I'm sorry to interrupt again, Rick, no, because I, I, I really have to underscore the point of this for the audience, because I've gotten away from, you know, promoting bad cop porn, because at some point, that's what it becomes, right? Well, bad cop did this, bad cop did You watch the video. Oh, look at this. Oh, this this incident of police concerning that one. I had a cop that I, I'm kind of familiar with him, Sergeant Good. I've been around for a while. And, uh, you know, he, he wasn't mean to me or nothing. He took, me, you know, he took care of me all the way to jail, 85 miles an hour, handcuffed in the front seat of his truck. But, but other than that, you know, it wasn't too bad. A little scary. But Rick, we have to let people know, like, because it what is it? It was because you're because of the mom in this case. Well, my mom thought that calling the police was the good was the right idea. We have to like when I say Don't only call police. call police as a last resort. Right. People have to understand what that means and why I say that is because you call the police bad shit is going to happen one way or another like you you i, I don't want to say absolute certainty obviously but no you really increase the risk of making someone an unnecessary victim of the police state and the criminal justice system so it i, I it, we what we are doing anybody you know uh, copblock.com any anybody who's sharing these 
police and, and law enforcement and, and you know, legal consequence court system horror stories, even, even relatively petty ones, what we are doing is saving lives, not just dogs' lives, that, but you know, saving the, lives of people who get run Amendment through the ring. I mean, there's, the First Amendment auditors are really doing a, a good job. Some of them, now there's some bad ones out there, don't get me wrong, but there's some really good ones. The Batusai and Philip Turner, who got Turner versus Driver here in Texas, you know, and, and uh, News Now Houston, David down there in Houston, making making the cops, count, holding them accountable. Justin Pulliam, holding them accountable. You know, we got some good First Amendment auditors around the country. You know, yep, you absolutely. Got, you know, if, if, anybody, if you don't know what a First Amendment audit is, Google the term, look it up. Basically, it just means going recording government officials auditing them to find out how much they respect the First Amendment right to report in public. And, and it's another a, thing about the First Amendment auditors, you know, they're independent guys, so they get, they make money from the people, and that, you know, and they're going to freak, you know, anyway, it, it, they're good guys. I mean, I like what they're doing. Some of them. <laughs> There's a couple of them that just go cussing the cops, and, and I don't agree with that. I don't think anybody should be cussing another person. You know, we, we got to so, talk civilly to each other. So, Rick, before we get into the political implications of your case, yes, sir, because this is this is a interesting intersection here where we have seen, like, and you know, it when 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 everybody everybody in America is subject to this kind of bullshit, and then it happens to a libertarian who just so happens to be running for office. It's hard to say. Well, they're fucking with you because because you're running for office. Yeah, when it's like oh, they're, they're just messing with everybody all the time. Was, I don't think that right. was it at all. I wasn't a I wasn't a major player in the in, in the game there, but I did get eleven percent of the vote. Hey. Well, but they can keep you from being. Um, I mean, if they can just like they right now, the it's not really fair for Republicans and Democrats to say, well, you know, it's it's not a big deal for us to leave libertarians off of the ballot or out of this poll because you know they're they're insignificant. It's like, well, why why are we insignificant? Because of the part of it is because of this kind of harassment. Part of it is because continuously being left out. But before we get to that, what I want, I want, can you give us like a depth, a, a sort of a a complete accounting of of how much you have been victimized by the state over this incident? How much time? How much money? How much harassment? How much jail time? How much you've had to put into dealing with this and since I spent that like, I over the last six years? I just spent the one night in jail, right? But then the court dates, and I got a court-appointed attorney who who I thought was going to be a really good guy. He's a retired Dallas cop, a veteran, you know, from the Army, and I thought he was going to be a good guy. He didn't do nothing for me. He didn't do a dang thing for me. And that that's where I'm trying to go to is the ineffective assistance of counsel. And that is, that's really hard to prove and without an attorney. And I've been, I've been to trial. Got tried, convicted by by a jury of my peers. Six people in Texas. They do that for a mis. It's only a class A misdemeanor. That's probably why they haven't really come and got me. If it was a felony, they'd probably been kicking in my door already. But right, you know, since, since it's a class A misdemeanor, I said class C, a class A misdemeanor. Four years. I mean, four thousand dollars and up to a year in jail is what the punishment is for a class A. And so, um, I went through that trial and all of that stuff. And shoot, just just going to court and that, that stuff every day, you know, in the trial. Just, they the jury went out for five minutes. I mean, five minutes. They, they didn't even have time to sit down and take a roll call, man. I mean, I went outside to smoke a cigarette before I even finished. They were already back. So wow. Yeah, and then the judge, she really liked me, Miss Judge. I don't know if I should say her name on <laughs> Judge. It's all public record, right? Judge Perryman. She's a good girl. I mean, I like her. She's a nice judge, but she's an ass. She's a judge. She's a, you know, she's a, a bar member. That's all I can say. The bar. Members <laughs> of the bar are no good for me. And, and they effectively taken over the government anyway. The bar. Yeah. The presidents have been bar members, you know, and it just goes on. The legislatures, most of them are all bar members. Yeah. And so that, now I can't get a driver's license. If I go down there to get a driver's license, they're going to arrest me. So having to drive around, worried about that all the time, you know. Or I get me a driver. I got me. I got real close to getting getting the pinned up. But watching some of the First Amendment auditors, I found out that you don't have to ID if you're a passenger in the car. So we got pulled over at 2 a.m. at a McDonald's, and 
in a faraway land of Corsicana. And uh, we got, he asked me for my ID and I told him no. So I got away there. We, and we didn't even get a ticket that night. He let us go. But, but that's pretty scary. You know, I'm just a matter of, you know, it could, he could have went, he could have went south on me and started wanting my ID, demanding my ID, getting my ID like they, like I've seen them do. So I was, again, lucky. That wasn't too long ago. And now, um, well, they want to revoke my probation. <laughs> that's what her, that's what the KPS warrant is, I guess. And I just I just stay low, stay off the radar. I have been like to what is it, free the weed, and a couple of other little little outings here and there. And I went, to, I decided to go to the uh, the precinct conventions in the in the county convention, and, uh, and I was pretty much done with the the party after that. Well, it's uh, you mentioned that you were sued by Greg Abbott as the attorney general for failing to turn in a, a piece of paperwork that resulted in this, this judgment of, of thirteen thousand dollars. Yeah, that, <laughs> that's funny one. Yeah, thirteen thousand to six hundred dollars or two hundred dollars. I think anyway, somewhere around that number for failing to turn in a personal finance report, which. I mean, I don't make any money. I'm on Social Security disability. I don't have any any assets really to claim. I don't own a house. I don't own a car. Well, anyway, not in my name. And and uh, yeah, so they sued me for that. And you know that I guess that's still on there. They also took me to criminal court for that, which I had to go all the way to Austin. Now I, I didn't answer the 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 civil court case. I just I ignored that one, and I ignored all the letters that they kept on sending me about me owing the money. Because I thought they were stupid anyway. And the only one that had a real gripe about it should have been the Republican that I was running against, Dr. Spitzer. He's the only one that really had a legitimate gripe for, you know, about my reports to me. That's my idea. But the Texas Ethics Commission decided they would come after me. And I wasn't the only libertarian. There was a whole there's a whole bunch of us that were on the list. And if you look, there's still several of us on the uh, Texas Ethics Commission bad boy list or delinquent flyer filers list. <laughs> i'm still on there i'm not the number one i used to be pretty high up on the on the ranking there and the, and the amount of money owed but there's some other ones that got way higher than that now so i guess they're trying to collect all right rick so we've got a couple people in the comments here asking about the flag flying behind you especially after cj our producer yesterday uh, at least in our in our patron only post production show, uh, so that would be the only flag he would support flying because the conventional flag of the United States is technically a wartime flag. Why why are you sitting behind or sitting in front of uh, of the flag that we see there? What well, that that's the peace flag, Adam. I tried to get you to fly that out there at, the, at Gardenia, I guess you're calling it now. It was Freedom Ranch, it was Freedom Farm. Yeah. We, hey, we, we, we have our own flag now. It's, it's, it's I, I heard, I heard you, That's what you told me. You were going to have your own flag. So. <laughs> but I tried to get you to fly this one. That's the U.S. the U.S. civil flag or the peace flag. And if you notice, the, the, the lines go across instead of the other way, vertical, horizontal. I get those two mixed up. <laughs> anyway. So, Rick, just... You've been through a lot with this case. Yeah, we just, I've got other cases too, Adam, but we won't. Like, not, not, not out, my rap sheet, nothing compared to yours, brother. Nothing, <laughs> or your uh, resume, I should say. Not a rap sheet, it's a resume. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in my case, it's a resume. Thank you. Well, it, with, with your case, uh, what are the takeaways? You know, What do you want people to learn from your experience? Well, uh, I'm not guilty. So, uh, and, the, and it was kind of ramrodded and it was kind of, a bad deal. My attorney didn't do anything for me. My appeals attorney couldn't do anything for me because trying to prove the ineffective assistance of counsel, it's a mess. And and how you got to bring that up? It's got to be in post conviction. And trying to find an attorney to go pro bono is uh, in a criminal case is not easy to find one of them. They all want money. I don't blame them. You know, it's what makes the world go around or or whatever. So yeah, I don't know, Adam. I, uh, I mean, I'm going to continue. Till, till they catch me, I guess, and then I'll have to deal with. Then I'm gonna call everybody and make sure we get my story out. You know, it is kind of a weird thing to be facing this right now, and I and I and I'm, and I mean, under 
coronaphobia lockdowns and martial law and, and the economic upheaval that we're experiencing right now. I'm hoping that a lot of people with relatively petty cases are going to be able to just, you know, let that shit go. You know, just, no, nah, you know what? Hey, I couldn't respond to your letters because coronaphobia. Or like, oh, you know how you wanted me to come to court and you got me for failure to, well, my grandma lives with me at home and I can't go to court because then I might get her infected. Like, you know, I, I hope that, you know, the, the coronaphobia is an effective excuse against enforcing all of this, you know, all these, these petty victimless crime, probation violation, failure to appear, you know, sort of bullshit legal circumstances. So, Rick, I, well, if you get to the next phase, if there's anything you need to update us for on your case, we'd love to have you back again. And I, I hope that, that your story in this interview can serve as an appropriate warning for people who don't know, like, yeah, even then, don't call, no, no, even then, don't, what about no, even then, don't call the police. Yeah, don't, I mean, yeah, I wouldn't, I, I that's the that last resort. Usually when you have somebody dead, you have to call them, <laughs> you know, that might be a time, well, I still wouldn't dial 911, though, if they're dead already, you just dial the regular number. They'll try to get you on that one, too. <laughs> you call 911 when it ain't an emergency or something stupid. All right, yep. brother, I appreciate you, man, having me on the show. I appreciate I get You got Roger Stone coming on tomorrow. That's the most excellent deal going on there, brother. That's gonna Thank be you for the stage for him. Peace and love to you, brother.